West Kern Community College District, Dr. Dina Maloney. Please welcome her. Before you say anything and do your introduction, we have to do the little Jeopardy quiz with you. Are you ready? Okay, you have not been briefed on this, have you? Okay, good for you. All right, take a look at the screen, folks. The answer is the first band entry of its kind in the Pasadena Tournament of Roses Parade way back in 1928. I think I know this. Is it, what is the TAP Union High School girls band? Girls Band, yes indeed, right you are. It's very important that we stress that. All right, now you can do your introduction. Very good. Well, welcome everybody. It's such a pleasure to see you all here and to, to listen to the incredible insights and, and perspectives of those we've heard so far. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, but before I do, I just want to acknowledge uh, some of the elected officials that we have here with us today. Of course, we all know <clears throat> we just heard from uh, the Congressman Kevin McCarthy from the 23rd Congressional District. I also want to acknowledge from the 34th Assembly District our, our Assemblywoman Shannon Grove. From the Kern County 4th District, County Supervisor David Couch. From the Kern County 5th District, Supervisor Leticia Perez. From the City of Taft, Randy Miller, Mayor. Dave Knorr, Mayor Pro Tem. Councilman Orchard Cryer. Councilman Josh Bryant. And Councilwoman Renee Hill. And from the West Kern Community College District, our Board of Trustees, Board President Billy White, Board Secretary Calvon, Trustee Michael Long, Trustee Don Cole, and Trustee Emmanuel Compass. Welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for being here. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Bryce Harris, Chancellor of the California Community College System, unanimously elected as, uh, selected by the system's Board of Governors. Dr. Harris began his tenure in November of 2012. Dr. Harris leads the largest system of higher education in the nation, with 113 individual colleges across 72 community college districts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Prior to assuming responsibility as chancellor, Dr. Harris served 16 years as chancellor of the Los Rios Community College District in the Sacramento region, and also served prior to that as president of Fresno City College, and was a faculty member and vice chancellor in the Kansas City, Missouri Community College system. Dr. Harris asked me to keep this short, but there are some things I want you to know about him. He really does understand the important connection between community colleges and the economy, and has served on numerous boards, which has that as its focus. Under Dr. Harris's leadership, the California community colleges have expanded access to higher education by approving pilot programs to offer bachelor degrees at 15 community colleges across the state. He also initiated a task force 
on workforce, jobs, and the economy, which has produced 25 recommendations to improve our system's capacity to prepare career-ready graduates of the California Community College system. And perhaps most significantly, the goal has been established to increase the total number of community college completions by nearly a quarter million additional students over the next 10 years. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium a visionary leader who is truly transforming the California community colleges, a man I'm pleased and proud to consider a colleague, Dr. Bryce Harris. I was uh, raised in Western Oklahoma. That sounds very familiar to me. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be with you today. I uh, genuinely appreciate the invitation from Taft College and from all these wonderful sponsors that are listed on the panel behind us. It uh, really is a pleasure for me to uh, lead the California Community College System, and as you can see on the uh, screens on either side, the smiling faces of those students, and they'll act as transitions as I uh, move through this presentation today. I took this uh, post about three years ago, and as you can imagine, with 113 colleges all across this uh, state, there's not as much humor in my job as I wish there were. However, uh, I'm married to an elementary teacher, so there is rarely a day when she comes home that I don't get something enjoyable out of uh, her fifth, uh, fourth, or third grade class. And I'm reminded, since I uh, seem to be standing between you and lunch, of a student of hers named Giovanna. Giovanna was a fairly precocious young lady who uh, said to Barbara one day, you know, Ms. Harris, I don't feel very well. I think I'm going to throw up. And Barbara said, oh, don't do that, Giovanna. Stand right there. I'll be right back. She turned to the rest of the class and she said, will you all line up over there? I'll be right back. I'm going to take Giovanna to the office. And she turned back and Giovanna said, Ms. Harris, why are they lining up? And Barbara said, well, they're going to lunch. And Giovanna said, well, I think I'm going to have to lunch to throw up. <laughs> so I always encourage you to try to wait until after my presentation to fall ill if that's at all possible. I... Uh, I do want to talk to you today about your community college system and about our relationship with workforce development. The California community colleges are the largest workforce provider in this country. We work day in and day out at all these institutions to try to make better connections, not only with students that want to transfer to bachelor degree granting institution, but those who want to enter directly into the world of work, into the jobs that many of you have in your companies and organizations. And so I, uh, I think it's worthy to take a couple of minutes to talk to you about the history of the system. It began back in 1907 when we were codified in the uh, state statutes and the, the original purpose for the colleges at that time was simply a transfer, get people ready to go to UC and to uh, the equivalent of the California State University system. It wasn't long after that, however, in uh, 1917 that they actually added vocational education. At that time, vocational education was uh, wood shop and home economics, but that was the beginning of our entree into workforce development. Our mission stayed pretty static for quite a while, and then in 1976, they added community service to our portfolio. And many of you may have taken advantage or have family members who've taken advantage of those community service kinds of courses, they run the gamut. Uh, they're uh, especially popular with people who are approaching retirement and want to learn how to do ceramics or uh, want to learn to uh, play a musical instrument. But that uh, particular strand of our message, uh, uh, our uh, mission has been soft pedaled in the last few years while we've had this financial crisis. Then if you look forward to uh, 1988, we had adult education involved, and that's when we first started doing developmental and remedial education. Unfortunately, we found an increasing number of students coming to our colleges that were ill-prepared for college. And then the final change in our mission until recently was in 1996, when workforce development and economic development and the California Community College's role in that was added to our mission. And then just last year, as you heard, uh, 
uh, the president say we added, uh, thanks to the legislature and Governor Brown signing the legislation, the uh, community college baccalaureate uh, at 15 colleges up and down the state. Now, most of those are going to be technical degrees, and they, uh, interestingly enough, may ultimately evolve to all of our colleges and may involve some of the very uh, workforce needs that your companies have. So when you look forward then, uh, today's community colleges, going back uh, almost 110 years ago, have grown significantly. We opened our 113th college in Clovis, California about two months ago, and we're now serving about 2.1 million students. Actually, about one out of every 14 adults in California over the age of 18 is enrolled at a California community college. So when you look at a system of this size, it's diverse institutions. Believe me, uh, uh, colleges in Taft and in uh, Siskiyou's and Redwood and Lake Tahoe are a lot different than the ones we find in East LA or in downtown uh, San Francisco. The diverse institutions with a myriad of kinds of programs and activities going on, uh, in the job I'm in, the challenge is to try to keep this system focused. And really, it became clear to me pretty soon after taking this job that we really have three responsibilities. The first one is to restore the access we lost, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, during the tremendous recession when we were forced to ration education. We literally had to cut our schedule and couldn't offer students the courses they need. Getting students back in these colleges is extremely important. In addition to that, the students that are in our colleges need to succeed in greater and greater numbers. Unfortunately, and I'll share some of these numbers with you a little bit later, we are finding students coming to us less and less prepared and struggling mightily to try to compete their, complete their programs. And then finally, and that is this role I'm here to talk about today, our role in workforce development, preparing a workforce for the future of California and ultimately for the future of this country. It is a horrendous and tremendous challenge but when we are taking on full force, and I'll go into detail in a moment. So why is all this important? Now this may be a little hard for you to see, but I'll explain it to you. If you look at the top bar, in the oldest demographic of our workforce, the 55 to 64 group, and by the way, I, I think that means I'm in the irrelevant section of the workforce, because I'm uh, across that over. But in the 55 to 64 group, we are still third in the globe in terms of higher education attainment. In other words, the percentage of our population in that workforce demographic that has some kind of college attainment, a certificate or a degree of some sort. However, when you look at that chart and you see uh, our labor force getting younger and younger, you see we fall further and further behind. And in fact, in the youngest demographic, the 24 to 35 year old group that's supposed to be coming out of college and going into the workforce, we've now slipped to 14th in the globe. Now this chart is way too hard to see, but what it tells you is that the United States stood stagnant over the last many decades, while all those countries on the other side of the uh, chart there had a, a population that was increasingly educated. So the, the, the shining example was that among that 55 to 64 work group in South Korea, they had in that group only about 12% of the population that had higher education attainment. However, when you look at that group's 24 to 35 uh, age population, they now have nearly 70% that have some kind of college attainment. And then Japan and Canada and a number of these countries have passed us by. In fact, for the first time in the history of this country, it is not inconceivable that we will have a generation that is less educated than the one that came before us. And that is something we simply cannot allow to happen if we're going to remain globally competitive. Now, that's been our clarion call to work to build a strong workforce for California. And when you look at that, the thing you notice is the skills gap our colleges are facing, and it is a tremendous one. First of all, the uh, educational attainment, which we believe is the key to the future. You can see if you go back to 1970, only about a quarter of the jobs that were being created then required education beyond the high school diploma. Fast forward to the 1990s, and that increased to 56%. More than half of the new jobs in the 1990s needed education beyond high school diploma. And now we know that by 2020, 
65% of all the new jobs created are going to require some kind of education beyond a high school diploma. And that's why this country is struggling, because in fact we find fewer and fewer adults enrolling in college and fewer and fewer young people getting into the workforce. This shows you we have about 6.3 million jobs that will come online in the next few years in California. The question is, will we have the workforce to match up to those? There's going to be a tremendous skills gap, and what this shows you is that depending where we are in the state, we stand the risk of having a skills gap. For example, right here in this area, energy is one of the potential skills gaps. If we don't find a way to educate your workforce, you're not going to be able to find the employees you need for your companies in energy and in the related fields in energy here in the Central Valley. And so the labor force supply really requires that we have more uh, workers participating in an education. We think somewhere in the neighborhood of a million is the gap that California is going to face in the next few years. And when you look at the trends, they are very worrisome. This little chart shows you that there's been a 6.8% decline in the number of young people that are getting into the higher education system. And in fact, overall, there's about 40% of young adults that are standing on the sidelines in fact, there's 15% of them that are considered to be disconnected. That means they are neither at work nor in school. And obviously, as a country, we can't continue if we're going to remain competitive with those kinds of numbers. And so then we do look at training and education as the secret to the future. This little chart shows you that if a region can increase the educational attainment of their workforce by one year, it has a 10.5% positive impact on the GDP of the region. So if we could find a way in the Central Valley to have the overall workforce add a year to their education at any level, it means that much growth in your GDP here in this region. And so restoring the United States leadership is going to take increases in the number of people going to school, in the success of those who are going to school and in our ability to develop this workforce. Now, why is California important and why do the California community colleges make a difference, not only in California but in the country? Because in America, one out of every five students enrolled in a public community college in this country are enrolled right here in California. And in fact, one out of 10 students in American public higher education are enrolled in a California community college. In fact, if you add the University of California and the California State University, one out of every eight students in an American public higher education institution is right here in this state. We simply have to get this right. If we do, not only will we advantage California, but we're likely to restore or begin to restore American global competitiveness. So, what does all that mean and how are we doing? Well, let's talk about access first. And the news here has not been good in recent years. Back in 2008-9, we had about 2.6 million students in California's community colleges. But during the terrible financial downturn, we were forced to ration education, cut classes, and that enrollment fell to about 2.1 million. A half a million Californians put on the sidelines that wanted access to their colleges and couldn't get it. But we seem to have turned the corner. Thankfully, because of the passage of Prop 98 and more state revenue, we have been able to add back courses over the last two and a half years for an additional 200,000 students. And so you can see, finally, that enrollment trend is starting back up. It's more noticeable here in the number of courses that we've offered, which again will attract more and more students back. That period of rationing was especially problemsome because not only did we turn students away that wanted to get in our colleges, but even those who were in the colleges had to delay their ability to complete their program because instead of taking 12 or 15 units, they were forced to take only nine because they couldn't get the classes. So what that meant was the system bogged up, students couldn't get in on the front end, students that were in couldn't finish and get out. Finally, as we're beginning to add back those courses, we are seeing that enrollment begin to turn around. And it's very, by the way, spotty. It's uh, growing uh, here in the Central Valley. It's not growing in the Bay Area, and I'll tell you why uh, in a moment. 
This is perhaps the most troubling slide of all, and that is, I told you a moment ago that one out of every 14 adults in California is enrolled in a community college. Back in 08, 09, when we were at our height, that number was one in every 11 adults in the state. So you get an idea what the participation rate has done. Now, we think we're bottoming out because we are adding those courses back, and we do think we'll see some students coming back, but there are some downward pressures on our enrollment. The first one is an improving economy, because we know that our colleges and the enrollment tend to run in opposition to the economy. So when the economy goes south, then our uh, population says, now's the time to go to school, now's the time to upgrade my skills, now's the time to make myself prepared for bigger and better jobs in the future, and our enrollment goes up. That's why when the financial crisis hit and so many people were out of work and wanted in our colleges and we were having to ration education, it was the worst of all worlds. Uh, the other uh, uh, damper on our enrollment is that high school graduation rates in California are starting to flatten out. It doesn't mean they're going down, it just means they're slowing and slowing considerably. However, as I told you a moment ago, there is one huge upward pressure on our enrollment, and that is the requirement for more and more education to be competitive in the workforce. What we are finding is an increasing number of young people coming out of high school, some of them going directly into the world of work, and they're realizing in a year or two years or three years that they simply can't compete. They come back to the colleges to try to get a skill or prepare, prepare themselves for transfer to get a better life get a better salary to uh, get the economy and their own economy uh, flourishing. So that upward pressure we think is going to continue, especially if those charts I showed you earlier about the number of new jobs requiring an education beyond a high school diploma tend to be true. Now what about the success of our students? Well, the news here is uh, mixed as well. If you look at our students, they are increasingly unprepared to go to college. If a student comes to our colleges prepared to go to college, they don't need any remediation. There are college students, when they walk in the door, they have a better than 70% chance of succeeding. However, if they come to us unprepared, in need of remediation, that potential to succeed drops down near 40%. And overall, the number is about 49%. Now, you may scratch your head and say, why does it only go up a couple of percentage points? Well, it's because of this next chart, which is perhaps the most troubling in the deck, and that shows you that three out of every four students that come to our colleges are not college students when they come here. They need remediation in either math or English or both. <clears throat> now, there are a lot of reasons why that is the case, and a lot of people say, well, do we blame the high schools, or do we blame the family, or do we blame of students themselves, and the truth is there's plenty of blame to go around, but it doesn't make any difference because when they get to our door, we have to deal with a population that is less and less prepared. And so as you can imagine, remedial education and developmental education has become a very, very big part of the work that we do, and if we can move them from the unprepared to the prepared category, you can see on the chart what kind of difference that can make. And we are having some success. This shows you, for example, that the success rate in individual courses has gone up two percentage points over the last few years. And you may say, two percentage points, that's not a very big deal. But apply that to 2.1 million students and literally millions and millions of enrollments. And what it means is a lot more successful students. And we're seeing trends like this in basic skills in math, and English, and English as a second language. So we are beginning to see the qualitative part of our students and their success improve. As you heard earlier, we have a massive uh, program on increasing student success underway. We believe it's going to be eminently successful. It's going to take some time because we're changing the culture of the whole state, all 113 colleges, but we think we are likely to be successful and things are likely to get better. Now, transfer education is a very important part of what do we do. Yes, some of your workers come right out of our colleges directly into the world of work, but many of them transfer to one of the California State University or the University of California uh, colleges. 
And thankfully, over the last few years, we've worked especially close with the California State University system, and our faculty have created 1,900 new degrees that guarantee a student, if you'll take the courses we ask at the associate degree level and get a transfer degree, you'll go right into any one of the CSUs where uh, they offer the program you want. <clears throat> now, in the first year we rolled those out, 800 students got those degrees. In year two, that number went to 5,000. In year three, it went to 12,000. And we got the numbers just earlier this week. And the past year, 13, 14, uh, it's gone to 21,000 students. So as you can see, this is an increasingly popular pathway through a community college and into a CSU. I might pause here a moment and just ask by a show of hands, how many of you in this room have either attended or have a wife, son, daughter, family member who's attended a California community college? That gives you an idea of the impact of these institutions. And so the future then focuses on improving workforce education. And that's the real focus of my reason for being here today, is to talk to you about that linkage between higher education and often K-12 education and your workforce. When you look at the workforce, the Board of Governors that oversees this system decided uh, in November of last year that we really needed to take a better look at the way we were delivering workforce education. It is a very complicated and very expensive activity that really has struggled in recent years. And so they formed this task force, and uh, the task force really had four responsibilities. The first one was to try to figure out a way to train our students for jobs that already exist in California. One of the things we hear over and over from you as employers is I've got these great jobs and you don't have any students coming out to take them. A mismatch of the education that students get and the jobs that you have. So the first responsibility of the task force was to address that. The second one was to say, you know what, we need to reverse this cycle of sending jobs out of California. Yes, we have a difficult taxing environment here, we have a lot of regulation, but we know that companies tend to go where the workforce is. Now, unfortunately, in your line of work, you have to go where the energy is. And so you can't take your business and move it to another state. But most of the businesses in California can do that, and too many are doing that. So we want to make certain that we have a workforce that not only keeps companies in California, but attracts them back to this state as they see the workforce advantages of living and working in California. Thirdly, we know in America the greatest engine for job creation is in small businesses. And so we believe that our students not only need to have the educational background in a subject matter area, we also need to provide them with the entrepreneurial skills and spirit that if they want to go out and start their own business, they have the willingness and the ability to do that. And in order to accomplish all three of these things, we have to figure out a different approach to funding career tech education in this state. One of the challenges that we've faced in California is, as all of you know, we have a very volatile revenue stream in California. So we have years of terrible financial decline, and then all of a sudden things bounce back as they have in the last couple of years, and things shoot up. Now, in a college like here at Taft, it's very easy to manage the sort of transfer programs in history and psychology and communications because the ebb and flow of money doesn't have a direct impact on a, on a classroom that simply has a teacher and a marker board and a textbook. However, in career tech education, those are very expensive programs. They're equipment intensive. In the healthcare area, for example, they are very low student to teacher ratio. And so when this economic boom and bust happens, Colleges tend to have to cut those high-cost programs, and then when the money comes back, they tend to add back the courses that are easy to add back quickly, and that's not career tech education, in order to capture available revenue. And so what happens over a period of time is an erosion of career tech education, and we've seen it most vividly, vividly in our K-12 system in California. Over the last two or three decades, we've seen that erosion of career tech education, vocational education at the high school level. That's going to happen to us unless we figure out a way to finance career tech education so that our colleges like Taft can invest in the technologies you need in a workforce with the knowledge that the funding for those programs is going to continue even if the economy peaks and balances.
So the goal then of this group is to increase California economic competitiveness by providing a workforce with the skills that are relevant that match up with the needs you as employers have. And that group finished its work in September, transmitted that to the Board of Governors, and they will vote, I suspect, to endorse all those recommendations in uh, November, and we will spend the next couple of years working on implementing those uh, strategies that I talked about a moment ago. So what then uh, about the Central Valley? What about the, uh, the energy business in which all of you work? Well, I think first of all, it's uh, important to note that not only do you contribute $71.9 billion in California to the economy, this industry, but more importantly for why we're here, 456,000 jobs in this state are attributed to the work that you do. As uh, we heard uh, earlier when we talked about uh, employment, these tend to be high value jobs. The average wage in your industry when you apply uh, uh, statewide, uh, excluding the, the uh, gas station part of the business, the average wage is $81,000. That's a tremendous uh, uh, average salary, well above the state average for everything else. The job growth in the San Joaquin Valley and by 2030, depending on that Monterey shale you talked about earlier, could be as much as 196,000 new jobs. Think about that. That has a tremendous impact, not only on the Central Valley, but on the state of California. And of those jobs, uh, the uh, uh, EDC expects about uh, 48,000 of those to be related to extraction, another 28,000 in transportation, another 26,000 in sales and office, and the balance in all of the associated industries that support uh, oil and gas here in the Central Valley. You know what the jobs are. I don't need to tell you about that. And when you look at the workforce that exists in your Central Valley now, it is predominantly male. It tends to be fairly young, 75% of them are under 55, and about a third are under 34. However, there is a huge block in the over 55 group. I think you heard about that earlier today. Retirements are going to sweep your industry, and when it does, we're going to have even increasing labor market demands. Your, pop, your workforce is becoming increasingly diverse, as is all of California, and believe it or not, we are seeing the education levels rise in the Central Valley, and that's good news for your GDP that we talked about a moment ago. The colleges and the high schools in this region are providing a number of training right here at Taft. There is a, a uh, specific program. The numbers of courses are increasing. We see courses like basic drilling and well technology and petroleum engineering, and uh, Taft is creating some new programs. And here's the really good news. There are more than 500 students right here at Taft College alone, and their average age is, uh, is only 32, and they are increasingly diverse. And I told you earlier that the course success rates statewide are 71% for all courses in community colleges. In these energy-related courses at Taft College, the success rates are 97%. So that means students know there's a valuable job in the country. According to our salary surfer tool, we have a tool, and by the way, uh, those of you who have college age uh, students, you'll want to do this. You can go online to any one of the colleges, Taft's a great place, and you'll see this logo that says salary surfer. You click on that, and you can look at 150 of the most popular majors and professions, and you can see what a student made two years before they got a degree, two years and five years after they got a degree. So being an old communications major, I can tell you that my return on investment is almost nothing. I can make about the same I made two years before and two years after. However, when you look at the technologies, you find the return on investment in career and tech programs to be enormous. 48500 two years before they graduate, $82,000 five years after they graduate. Now think about the return on investment. They spend two years in a career tech program here at TAP. They went in making about $48,000 uh, annually, and within five years, they almost doubled that amount. It's really a remarkable return on investment. And if you have a son or daughter going off to major in music, I recommend you show them the salary service. 
And so our challenges are threefold, as I told you earlier. We need to restore access to this system. We need to enhance the success of our students. And we need to do a better job in workforce education. If we can do that, we truly do stand a chance of revitalizing not only the California economy, but this country's global competitiveness as well. If we don't do that, frankly, we stand to be just another one of those countries that fell by the wayside over time. I will tell you that this isn't about money. Yes, of course, our system would like to have more money to offer more courses. It's about the kind of hard work and dedication on the part of all of you who serve on our advisory committees and give us advice on how these programs ought to be developed and run. It's about all of us in these colleges that show up every day trying to help these students who are increasingly educationally disadvantaged get their feet on the ground and ultimately succeed. I believe, and I am very bullish on the future of California's community college and the future of California's workforce, but it's going to require an immense amount of work on, the, on behalf of all of us. And we simply have to stay focused. One of the challenges we face is that with 113 colleges all up and down the state, every time somebody hangs an eye, another bright, shiny object out, everybody wants to head over in that direction. We've seen, for the first time in my time in California, more than 25 years, we've seen the legislature and the governor invest for three years consecutively in improving student success in our colleges. That's the first time they've ever invested in our system in a qualitative program for more than one year. And so if we can stay focused for just another four or five years and stay on this track, I think you are going to see those success numbers turn around, you're going to see access restored, and you're going to get the workforce you need, you deserve, and you pay taxes for. I'm, uh, I'm reminded of just one more story about Giovanna, because as you can tell, this is a Herculean task. After Barbara had had a particular uh, difficult day at work and most of the students were gone, she was sitting sort of crumpled at her desk and Giovanna came up and put her arm around Barbara's shoulder and said, you know, Ms. Harris, if you just pluck your hair and put on a little lipstick, you'd feel a whole lot better. <laughs> and uh, some days I think that's what all of us ought to do, just fluff up our hair and put on a little lipstick. This has been a great opportunity for me. I want to thank you for uh, allowing me to be here today. Uh, I am very, very proud of your community college system. I think, frankly, it is probably the best investment you as a taxpayer make. I promise you that the people in the California community college system want nothing more than to deliver you an educated product, not only a workforce, but students who ultimately can see their lives change for the better because of the education they got at the California Community College. Thank you very much. Hang on, there we go. There's a man who knows his stuff. Now, I mentioned a little while ago that we are running ahead of schedule. So, I've been asked to take some questions from people in the audience. Don't be shy, I'll, I'll start it off myself by answering some of the questions that people ask when they come to the tapings of Jeopardy! in Culver City. Yes, I really enjoyed the Saturday Night Live takeoffs that they did. No, I have never met Sean Connery, but if I did, I'd punch him right in the gut. What do I do when I'm not taping shows? We tape five shows a day, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, usually three weeks on, one week off. So, and, but we do have the longest season of any television game or quiz show in America. Our season is 46 weeks of original programming, which means that we have only six weeks of reruns in the summer, and we like to feature some of our tournaments at that time. So if you figure it out, I work 46 days a year. Not exactly overworked, huh? What do I do when I'm not working? I drink. <laughs> uh, 
That always gets a laugh. Uh, I work around the house. I like to fix things. Uh, I just, my son, who is now living in New York and will soon open a small Mexican restaurant in New York, uh, bought a townhouse, one of those old brownstones, which is over a hundred years old and required considerable work. And I went to visit him about a month and a half ago and I brought two suitcases filled with tools. And it was really heavy, but under the weight limit, not over 70 pounds. And I used a lot of duct tape and clear tape wrapped around those bags so they wouldn't open when the baggage handlers threw them onto the ramps that would uh, take them into the plane. Well, when I arrived in New York, all of that duct tape and clear tape had been cut open by TSA, and they left a note inside saying for the security of our flying public, uh, we had to examine everything in your luggage bags. Now, one of the things I noted when I went to help Maddie is that in older houses, there's always something, but 24-year-old kids, they don't know what to look for. And that's where my expertise came in because I've spent a whole lifetime building and renovating homes. And I enjoy it. Uh, I'm often asked, when are you going to retire? I, I happen to mention in an interview when, uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, a reporter asked me, do you ever give any thoughts to retiring? And I said, yes. Well, they jumped from, yes, I have given some thought to retiring. They took that and they said, Trebek is thinking of retiring. And everybody said, well, he's, how long has he got? How long is he going to stick around? And my answer to that is, as long as I keep enjoying what I'm doing, and as long as my talent, my abilities are not diminished too much. Uh, I've reached an age, I'm 75. So I'm, uh, I'm at an age where you have to start thinking about things like Alzheimer's. You know, uh, people contribute to different charities based on uh, all kinds of things. Some uh, will support the cancer research because someone in their family had cancer. Others uh, specialize in other diseases. Well, because of my age and because my memory was starting to fade a little uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I started contributing to the Alzheimer's Association. At least I think I started contributing to the Alzheimer's Association. But, uh, yeah, so I started doing crossword puzzles to keep my mind sharp, and it works. I've gotten better at it. So, a little bit of advice for you folks who are soon to enter your 70s. Now, if any of you have questions, yes, ma'am. Yes, the show does provide me with the suits. And uh, I have, I don't know, about 40 of them over the years. I've had a couple of hundred. But they get relegated to a wardrobe, uh, oh, a wardrobe building at uh, Sony in Culver City. And there are suits that are out of date now, of course. Uh, the three and four button jobs, I don't wear those anymore. The lady asked uh, an interesting question. Uh, she said, her mother, who is my biggest fan, uh, wanted to know about my suits. Uh, that brings up a sore point with me. Because, uh, not because of this lady, because she's a different, uh, this is a different situation. But I get that comment very, very often. My mother's your biggest fan. Now, I usually get that comment from someone who is in their 40s or 50s, which means their mothers, who are my biggest fans and who have the hawks for me, are in their 80s and 90s. Please, please, folks. 
encourage your 10 and 12 year olds to come to me and say, my mom's your biggest fan. She thinks you're hot and she's 32. Help an old man, please. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Well, you all saw a young man who was defeated a couple of nights ago, uh, Matt Jackson. Uh, he won about $400,000, I can't remember the exact figure. And earlier this week, we taped our Tournament of Champions that will air at the beginning of November. And Matt was one of the participants. And it made for an exciting moment because as we were taping those shows, after one show was taped, I brought Matt out in front of the audience and it just happened to be the day that Sony had cut the check for him, so I handed him a check for $384,000. Now he's in his 20s, right? 20, I can't remember what it was. But uh, in the tournament this year, eight of the 15 participants are in their 20s. So those bright young people are finding ways to try out for Jeopardy, and that's good news. In our audience, we had Brad Rutter, who won four and a half million dollars on Jeopardy. He won our first million dollar tournament, and our two million dollar tournament, and then the Grand Masters of a million dollars. So he's the biggest prize winner on Jeopardy. Ken Jennings, you'll all recall him, he won 74 shows in a row. And I mentioned that we take five programs a day, so he was around for a long, long time. He won so many shows that I was running out of questions to ask him in that little interview section. I would go to him before the program and I'd say, Ken, what do you want to talk about? Do you want to ask me some questions? And then David Letterman, who was still on the air at that time, started a rumor about Ken and me saying that Ken and Alex are thinking of moving to Massachusetts and taking out a license. <laughs> They're going to live together. We didn't take out a license. We just lived in sin. <laughs> yes? Uh, Bob Harris. Bob Harris. Him that we could... Well, Bob Harris was one of our very, very excellent contestants. He wrote a book, Prisoner of Trebekistan, based on his experiences on Jeopardy. Now, one thing that Bob Harris did, which set him apart from everybody else, he would look up when the Jeopardy programs that he was going to appear on would air, because we taped them in advance. Now he would say, oh, I'm going to be, I'm called in and we're going to be taping on October 20th, and that will be the shows for Thanksgiving week. Ah, there's probably going to be something about Thanksgiving history in that material. He didn't know what the material was going to be. The contestants never know what the material is going to be. But he figured out that, hey, I'll prepare myself that way. And he was very successful because of that. And he established a, a, a small charitable foundation in which, uh, I forget the name of it, but all it costs is $25. He lends $25 at a time to some poor woman in Kenya or Uganda. Okay, what is it called? K-I-B-A, Kiba. And one of the things I've discovered in my travels for World Vision over the years is that when you support women in developing countries and lend them money, you always, always get it back. The guys are deadbeats. The women you can depend on, believe me. So if he's going to be talking about that, give him my, my regards. He's a, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. Anyone else? Yes. 
Please. She'll bring you the microphone. Thank you. Uh, at home, I have a nine-year-old, and she wanted me to ask this question. And I know her, her mom is not your biggest fan. Okay. Uh, sorry. But, uh, yeah, I am. Uh, what do you tell to those young kids, especially so many 20-year-olds are participating in the show? What do they look to besides paying attention to school history class and everything else to become a participant or competitive in the show in the future, possibly? Well, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I've always had a great curiosity for life, for everything in life. I want to know how things work, and it bothers me when I lack that knowledge. I didn't know, for instance, and I discovered it just a little while ago, because uh, one of our future talkers mentioned to me, we were talking about water in California, and I did not know that in these old wells here in the state of California, when you extract a barrel of oil, at the same time you are extracting perhaps three barrels of water. Now the average person out there, I guarantee you, is not aware of that kind of information. But acquiring information has always excited me. And that's the message I try to get across to the young people. Learn as much as you can. The more you know, knowledge will never hurt you. The more you know, the more developed you become the more your personality expands, the more understanding you get to be. Uh, for 25 years, I hosted the National Geographic Society's Geography Bee, and I would often be asked, well, why is geography important? Well, it's important because if you know about other civilizations, how they developed, why they developed in a certain place, why they follow this religion as opposed to that religion, you will be able to understand their point of view in any discussion. Even if you disagree, you'll be able to appreciate where they're coming from. And that, as a contestant in the Miss America pageant would say, that will lead to world peace. <laughs> okay? So the more you know, the better off you're going to be. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Go ahead. I'll hear you, and I'll repeat the question. First, I want to thank you for uh, being a part of the program that's all that great, family friendly. You're not worried about anything. Um, uh, I wanted to ask if there was another uh, game show that you've ever wanted to host. Just one out. Is there any other game show I have wanted to host? Yes, Hollywood Squares. I think I had a show similar to that. I called it Son of Hollywood Squares. We had uh, triangles instead of squares. We had six celebrities instead of nine. But that was a delightful job. You asked the question of a celebrity, they gave you a funny response, and you laughed. What could be better than that? I once asked a contestant uh, who was from outside of California, she was from one of the northern states, many, maybe Wyoming or Montana, and I said, what brought you to California? And she said, I came to California to look for a husband. And Tom Poston, the late Tom Poston, who was one of our celebrity guests that day, just shouted out, whose husband did you come to look for? <laughs> so that was a great hosting job for me and Hollywood Squares. Uh, our head, uh, our producer, our executive producer on Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, as a matter of fact, used to write for Hollywood Squares. So he comes up with a lot of good lines from time to time. Yes, uh, I've got a question right here. Okay. I need to know, and I'm curious, how much time do you spend learning all those words out on Jeopardy? I've never even heard of them. I get the five games we are going to tape on oh, Tuesday or Wednesday at 7.30 in the morning. I go to work at six in, the, 6 in the morning, and I go over mail and sign autographs and photographs, and the games get to me at 7.30. It takes me an hour and a half to go over the five games, and then we go into a production meeting, 
and that lasts about 45 minutes, and we review all the games in case the games are selected at random, so there might be uh, a little conflict between one game and the next game. There might be a clue that's similar, and we don't want to have that. We don't know who the contestants are going to be. Uh, the writing department never knows the identities or the backgrounds of the contestants. And with regard to the words, uh, if there are words that I feel are going to present difficulties in, pr pr in, pr in saying properly, I look them up in a dictionary. So I think it's important for someone in my position with the kind of show that Jeopardy is to try as hard as possible to pronounce words correctly, foreign words correctly also. If there are two accepted pronunciations for a word and the contestant gives one, on occasion I will give the other one, perhaps the more popular one. And when a contestant comes close, you'll have noticed, uh, I'm sure, that there are times, I, I don't want the contestants to feel bad about their performance, so sometimes they make a mistake and they'll get down on themselves, and I, I will come in with something like, oh, you were probably thinking of this instead of that. You had a choice there and you just went the wrong way. So my job as the host is to get out of the way and make it easy for contestants to win a lot of money. And lately, they have been doing just that. In our Tournament of Champions upcoming at the beginning of November, the champion will walk away with a quarter million dollars. So we're doing what we can to help the economy. Okay? Anybody else? No? Yeah. Is, uh, is Shannon going to come up and take some questions now? Shannon Grove, your assemblywoman, ladies and gentlemen. And then Brock McMurray is going to come up and tell you how we're going to handle lunch because with all of you folks here, there has to be a system in place and he will tell you about that system. But for now, Assemblywoman, it's yours. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Give Alex a big hand, he's doing a good job, right? So, um, we're running a little bit early. We have an extra 15 minutes, so you're stuck with me. They weren't happy that my hair was going flat for the condensation of this tent, so they're gonna put me in the drip line section and uh, make it even worse. So I tried to put some thoughts together because I wasn't really prepared to come up and talk to you guys, but I wanted to talk to you about some things that are going on this Sacramento. You know that the governor has signed SB 350. You know that the bill was significantly uh, reduced down in the economic impact of the impact that it would have on the fossil fuels of the petroleum industry. But it still is, uh, to me, a negative bill. I can tell you that right now Governor Brown seems to be so angry and um, I know Friday when I spoke they said I didn't have a filter and I'll really try hard to use that filter today because I know that media is in the room. But um, Governor Brown is extremely angry with the fact that the oil industry was able to lobby some legislators to be able to understand uh, the importance of fossil fuels and energy and oil emissions. And when 350 was first introduced, it talked about reducing fossil fuels by 50%. Taking 50% of America's cheap energy out of the system to create a new economic revolution through green technology is what SB 350 was about. Believe me, I work with some seriously inept people in Sacramento. I was, that was, that was going to be a different word, but I'm really trying hard because my friend Becky's out there and she's like, use your filter, just use your filter. Um, but he's very angry. I watched a video of him signing with Senate Pro Tim DeLeon and Speaker Atkins, and they were very angry at the fact that this was not going to be a legislative uh, achievement for them. They were talking about how the governor is going to continue to allow the Air Resources Board to regulate and meet that 50% reduction in fossil fuels, even though it wasn't in the legislation. Now the good thing about that is it's only going to be in play as long as the governor gives the, a the ARB that authority. So what we want to do is make sure that the next governor doesn't transfer that authority to the ARB uh, that gets elected. And the reason why we want to make sure that happens is or the, the reason why we want to make sure that the, the reduction in the regulatory compliance with the ARB is for obvious reasons. Um, we have a serious issue with an unelected, unaccountable board that is regulating our industry. And when I say our industry, I say the industry that creates uh, economic security 
It creates jobs. There's a ripple effect in the jobs. I talked to, uh, Friday and I shared with you that I was in a meeting one time and the governor's staff was there and we were talking about permits back when Elena Miller was still in charge of the Division of Oil and Gas and Geothermal Resources and we weren't allowed to get permits. And this little guy, about, he looked like he was 12, fresh out of Berkeley, pulls his glasses down because I had made a statement that the first rig goes down on September 15th and we need to do something about it and do something about it now. And he pulls his glasses down and he goes, Miss Grove, that's only 15 jobs. And of course I fired back with something to the effect of, you know, don't, don't talk about stuff you don't know anything about. It's not just 15 jobs. There's a site crew, an excavation crew, a gravel crew. There's a truck driver that brings the gravel from the place where he picks it up and then brings it to the site. There's an engineering crew. There's welders, welders, helpers, roustabouts. There's rig welders. There's uh, in engineers. And I went down the whole list and I got to the point where I said, and Mona at Speedway Market has 15 cashiers selling the biscuits and gravy on the way to people's work. Don't you ever talk to me about jobs in my district. About that time, somebody from the governor's office came and said, Miss Grove, would you like to step outside? And I thought, dang, I'm getting thrown out of another meeting. And so I went outside and they let me know that Elena Miller would be let go tomorrow, that she'd be transitioned tomorrow, So, um, which was back then. So I know that the, the industry has great impacts on our state, and 99.9% .9 of them are very positive. And I need, we need to educate people in Sacramento. And I shared again on Friday, and I hate to keep repeating myself, but people in Sacramento don't tend to understand the valley or what the valley has to offer. And the reason I say that is because I was in the lounge one day having a cup of tea, and in walks a legislator that had been on what I call a toothpick committee hearing. It lasts six or seven hours. It's, you know, it's just a long hearing. And they, had, they were debating the high-speed rail. And she comes into the system, and, or into the lounge, and she says, Shannon, I'm so tired of your farmers disrupting progress. And I'm thinking, I'm just having a cup of tea. And so she says that, and she's mad, and she's getting her coffee, and she turns around and looks at me, and she goes, I've had it with your farmers so much that I am going to boycott them and buy canned food. <laughs> my other friend, Don Wagner, that was there, grabbed my arm, and he said, just don't. Don't. So I want to tell you that just like in the agriculture industry, where we need to educate people about the valley and what it has to offer, we need to educate people about the oil industry and what the oil industry has to offer. We offer jobs, and I just ran down a few jobs that we offer. We offer, um, you know, we talked earlier at the panel, and they say, you know, what about the nonprofits that you support? There is not one program or one nonprofit that I go to or event where there is not an oil company or several oil companies that are supporting our community through nonprofits and, our, and the community and the people that we serve in the nonprofit industry. It also creates a domestic security. You know, if we have to buy our energy or our oil from foreign countries that are um, hostile to us, that puts us in a very precarious position. And I think that what I try to convey to the, to the people in Sacramento is I represent an area that feeds and fuels not only this state, this nation, but this world, and we damn well better be respected for it. The governor, under, um, the governor under 350, I tell you, he's really angry that that legislation did not pass and he's authorizing the Air Resources Board to continue that reduction. I had the opportunity to take a tour as a legislator um, last summer to the ISO, the independent systems operating plants that we have. The independent system operators are responsible for controlling um, the grid and making sure that there's a, a, a correct influx of energy in the grid to supply power. And since we've gone on that um, S or AB32 where we're doing the 20% reduction in fossil fuels, they have grave concerns. Now, these are the people that run the grid. They have grave concerns on what they call the duck bill activity, where, the, where they have to in, introduce energy and fire up plants and everything and, and produce energy when we run out of sun and we run out of wind. Even though there is our governor and the Senate Pro Tem, that is trying to address um, energy issues with nothing but green technology, I tell you right here, they are vying for a Nobel Peace Prize and not taking any consideration of what it offers or what it does to our economy and our domestic security or the citizens of this state and this nation. That's all they're doing. They have no regard of how that, that legislation or any legislation that they put forth will change our lives. And we need to stand up and be a voice. Energy needs to be a positive voice. A lot of people in Sacramento think so negatively about energy. 
And so I had, I had an NPR reporter follow me around the Capitol, and he's always following me for a period of time. You know, Miss Grove, how come you don't care about water in your district? How come you don't care about clean water supply in your district? And, you know, of course, I just ignore him and walk down the hallway. And one day, you know, my filter wasn't working, and I said, you want to talk to me? Come to my district. So lo and behold, he shows up to the district, and Robin's going to have a heart attack. I know she's right in this table. Yeah, Robin's having a heart attack. So um, he comes to the district, and he gets in my conference room, puts a tape recorder in front of me, and he says, okay. He goes, let's talk oil and clean water. And I said, come with me. And I put him in my car. We drive up Chester Avenue, and we turn. We go down, and I get to the guard shack at Chevron. And of course, they're like, hi, Miss Grove. I go, hi. Can I go up here and just drive around for a minute? And he goes, sure. And he gets me a pass. Robin's breathing hard right now. Um, so we drive up by Brown's, or Brown's yard and we come back down and I, the guy was shaking. He really was. He was. His hands were like this and he's like, you know, am I safe here? You know, I said, absolutely. And when we got there, there was a Slumberjay truck that went by. There was a KBA truck that went by. There were a lot of women walking in hard hats. And he was very amazed at the fact that women are employed in the oil industry. That blew his mind. An NPR reporter from San Francisco, he was amazed that women were employed in the oil industry. And so we stopped and talked to a group of women. He got some information from them. We stopped and we uh, looked at some wells that were, were producing. And then we left there and we went down James Road and up 65. And I get to Chad Hathaway's house. And if you haven't been out at Chad Hathaway's house, you know that he has these beautiful great vineyards on these rolling hills. And then he also has these oil wells that are producing right in his backyard. And he has a well, an uh, injection well or something there. Anyways, and so he, we get to the gate and um, he's not home. So I'm texting him. I'm like, where are you, give me your gate code. He goes, where are you at? I get out your gate, give me your gate code. He goes, I'm in Ireland. So he gives me his gate code. And we go in, and the guy was so amazed that there would be an individual in our community that, that practiced what he preached, that said water is safe for the oil industry and water is safe for the, the ag industry. That our water, when you look at what Chevron, what CRC, Cal, uh, California Resources, and other companies are doing with like the Coelho Water District and providing more water for ag in this year when it's desperately needed because of the drought, and they call it produced water, it's just a byproduct of what's being pumped out of the wells. That is significant. When you look at what's being provided to agriculture so that we can grow food out of produced water, and praise God for Lorelei Oviat. You know, she's shown with that EIR. The bottom line is, is it absolutely give Lorelei Oviat a big hand. She's shown with that Kern County EIR. She has shown not only the state of California, but the nation that, that oil and producing and fracking or hydraulic fracturing is a beneficial use for water. She's done that, and I think that's pretty phenomenal. I, um, I guess, uh, I'm up here just killing time. Can you guys tell? <laughs> so I'm killing time. Something we worked on this year, I know a lot of people in the oil industry, because I get an update every week, have been affected by the Private Attorney General Act, class action lawsuits that are flowing through the oil industry. I see a bunch of people nodding their heads. We worked on a piece of legislation to create a, um, a 30-day cure notice for minor violations like a paycheck stub violation. For instance, if there's a space between your name or a period between the LLC, like, you know, something, company, period, LLC, comma, then those were considered paycheck violations and you were actually fined or being sued $200 per paycheck, per employee, per pay period, going back four years with a maximum of $7,000. And a lot, there's one particular attorney that's really targeting, targeting the Kern County industry um, especially oil and its uh, subcontractors. And so we're doing everything we can to try to stop that. We introduced a piece of legislation um, to give employers a 30-day correction on their paycheck stuff. Now you have to remember that um, I work with stupid people. I do. I, I just do. I was trying to think of a good word and kill time at the same time. So basically we got this bill through and now you have 30 days to correct your minor errors on your paycheck stub without the penalty applying that is under PAGA, the Private Attorney General Act, which caused millions of dollars to be expended out of the oil industry just this past year alone. PAGA, in, PAGA claims have gone up almost 400% in the last year, almost 10,000% over the last two years, especially right here in Kern County. And every week I get three or four claims that are filed in Kern County. So this piece of legislation will allow you a 30-day cure to fix those minor paycheck violations where we are being fined. So again, my reference to stupid people. Uh, 
in our world, and everybody in this tent world, you would think that if you had a space between your name or a period or a comma or a dash that was missing, you would think that you would be able to correct that paycheck stub and just move on. Your employees cashed a check, there was no harm, everything was taken care of. In Sacramento world, that 30-day correction means that once you're notified of the incorrect paycheck stub, you have 30 days to reprint all your paycheck stubs for all of your employees going back four years and provide those employees with a correct paycheck stub, even if you just have a missing comma or a missing period. Now, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but the bottom line is to reprint a paycheck stub, you know, click a button on a computer and reprint a paycheck stub, it's probably 25 cents. That's far better than a $200 per paycheck violation penalty. So that piece of legislation did pass. We also uh, worked on a piece of legislation to address the Gonzalez case in the Supreme Court regarding piecework. So anybody who got piecework or per diem or anything like that, um, that case was addressed where the penalties wouldn't apply. And it also gave piecework employers the opportunity to have a good faith uh, defense. So that if you made a mistake or you paid a bonus or you did something, it was in good faith. It wasn't just because you were trying to be mean to your employees. That particular piece of legislation was to encompass wage and hour. They did not put that in the piece of legislation. We are now fighting with them over making sure that every employer in the state of California has an de affirmative defense of operating in good faith in the state of California. Um, it's easy for me to argue business bills and fight for business, especially the oil or the ag industry, because I've been a business owner in this state for 23 years in spite of this state. And I think some of you guys feel the same way. I'm going to stop there. Yeah, absolutely. So that's some of the things that have gone on for Cal and in the state. So I'm going to stop there, and they've asked me to take questions. Um, please remember that um, I am trying really, really hard to apply my filter, so don't ask me about the CRC Union Project Labor Agreement. Does anybody want to ask a question? Nobody? I killed time. You reminded me of a line that I love that was uh, delivered by a member of the uh, uh, comedy group, the, the Blue, not the Blue, what is it? Larry the Cable Guy, what's the group? Blue Collar Comedy Group. He says, you can't fix stupid. <laughs> you can do all kinds of other things, but you can't fix stupid. So, uh, I'm sure a lot of you've all been sitting here very politely for the last few hours and you're thinking about food and the man who's going to explain how we're going to go about that is waiting in the wings right now. So Brock, Brock McMurray, come out here and he will tell you what you need to do, what procedure. And it's credit cards will be accepted, right? Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And um, if you didn't know it beforehand, um, Shannon Grove has a little bit of passion. And again, I am Brock McMurray, Executive Vice President, CFO at Taft College. And today, I'm also the czar of how we're going to conduct lunch. I have a strict script here. But before that, a little bit of housekeeping. We have a GMC truck, 2500 HD license plate, 8Y03347. It is out parked near the uh, oil monument and it is blocking an exit. So please, if that is your vehicle, uh, kindly move that uh, so they can have access to that exit. Okay. Uh, I have been asked to fill just a little bit of time. This is a true story. Uh, when I was in college, uh, Jeopardy would come on, I don't know, 4.30, 5 o'clock, and I would watch the episode. My roommate was in class at that time. And then a rerun would be shown about an hour or two later. And he would come back to the room, and uh, we would watch the show. We loved Jeopardy. So... Uh, Mr. Trebek, college students love Jeopardy. I think they still do. And that first year, he thought I was probably one of the smartest people on earth. 
Now, I didn't get them all right. I couldn't remember all of them. And then I, a few of them I knew there's no way he would think I would know that. So I won't answer that. Well, uh, by happen stance, uh, we were both business majors. And we, best friends, we, the next year, we got the exact same schedule. Is that you, Fred? So we had the exact schedule. And we had to watch Jeopardy at the same time. Immediately, he started to figure something out. I wasn't nearly as sharp as I was the year before. So I had to come clean. We still have a lot of fun with that uh, story. As a matter of fact, I was able to take a picture with uh, Alex Trebek last night. And I sent it to him, and uh, he texted me back a couple of times. Oh, yeah. Did you tell him the story? Well, Alex, that's the story. Uh, so I think, and hopefully we are ready for the food. Uh, since we have such a large group, we're going to dismiss by table numbers so that we may control the flow of traffic. So please be patient. Uh, a lot of people to get through the line. We request that you exit through the entry at my immediate left and work your way through the line, the buffet, and you will return in the entrance located between the lighting and production platforms also to the left. Uh, unfortunately, because of the size of our gathering, the catering staff will not be able to bus all the tables. So we ask for your understanding while keeping your luncheon dishes and cutlery at your table when you're finished eating. Uh, and so, to begin, I would ask that the guests at tables, this is, uh, you have to keep up with me here, take guests at tables 1, 2, 14, 15, 16, 17, 30, 31, and 32. Proceed. Hold on just a moment. Yes, Cody. We need about five more minutes. Okay, so then I'm going to sing. Help Alex. Uh, you know, I used to be a vice president of student services, and I would play uh, Simon Says with some of the student groups. Uh, Mr. Billy White, you... No, just kidding. So I think we're just a few minutes away, so if you'll remain patient, we will again, in just a moment, we will go with 1, 2, 14, 15, 16, 17, 30, 31, and 32. Hold on just a moment, and uh, we'll get started in that order, and then we'll call you a little bit later the rest of the tables. Thank you.
Okay, thank you for your patience. We're almost ready to serve. Just a few more minutes. Please be patient. Thank you. Okay, if it is your first time to uh, Taft and the Old Dorado celebration, you may or may not know this, but uh, one of the uh, historic celebrations that we have here is we have a group that uh, maintain order here in the city, as well as a group of outlaws. And uh, part of that celebration, they actually fire and shoot blanks. Those are blanks in the air. You may see people walking around with guns and cowboy hats please know that uh this this is part of a long standing celebration and uh, uh you may see someone or hear some what you think are gunshots but that is part of the celebration thank you Okay, we are serving. So the first group was tables 3, 4, 5, 11, 12, 13, 18, 19. Excuse me, that was the second set. First set's in line. Now should be going 3, 4, 5, 11, 12, 13, 18, 19, 20, 27, and 29. Please proceed to the outside catering area.
Okay, our next group will be tables 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 38. So tables 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 38. Please proceed out to the lunch area. Thank you. Next, I would ask that tables 45, 46, 59, 60, 61, 74, 75, and 76, please proceed to the outside catering tent. Our next group will be tables 28, 33, 34, 35, 42, 43, 44, 47, 48, 49, 56, and 58. Tables, again, tables 28, 33, 34, 35, 42, 43, 44, 47, 48, 49, and 56 and 58. Thank you.
Next, I would ask that tables 26, 36, 37, 39, 40, 41, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, and table 67, please proceed and get your lunch. Our next group of tables will be 55, 57, 62, 63, 64, 65, 70, 71, 72, and 73.
Next, I would uh, ask table 77, 78, 79, 80, 87, 89, and 90. Please proceed outside to the catering tent. Thank you. Our next group will be tables 66, 68, 69, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, and 91. 